present here. So I thought it perhaps is a good starting point is to place a little bit this area of research in the context of statistics, of modern statistics, since part of the audience is statisticians and part don't know anything about statistics. So classical statistics. Is, uh, is about basically typically learning a parameter that is a vector in d dimension and uh, from, from a certain number of samples uh, and samples and you have uh, n much bigger than d okay? and you typically prove things of this type that your estimator the distance of your estimator from the, the two vector uh, you know, goes to zero at some rate it depends on the number of samples. Right. So this is three line summary of what is <laughs> okay, that has been statistics until the year 2000 more or less. So then in around 2000, uh, people started being very excited about what they call high dimensional statistics. Uh, what is this? Now we are in the same setting, but uh, perhaps uh, the vector theta naught belongs to a set theta, that is a subset of Rd, okay? and this set theta has some kind of effective dimension uh, k. Let, let me you know, just skip over defining what uh, effective dimension means. Typically means the number of non-zero entries, or the rank, or something, stuff like this. And, and then you look at the case in which uh, the number of samples is uh, is actually much smaller than the dimension. So from a classical viewpoint is a lost cause, but it's much bigger than this effective dimension. And then you prove uh, stuff of this type, that this goes also to zero, and uh, you have some dependence on the, on the effective dimension. The general theme of, of uh, the things that have been presented today is uh, what I would call noisy high dimensional statistics. <coughs> that is, in this case, well, typically we look at cases in which these three parameters are of the same order. So k is of the same order as d, of the same order as n, and perhaps k over n or k over d goes to limit epsilon, and perhaps n over d goes to limit uh, delta. Uh, but the important fact is that we are not satisfied, or one important fact is that we are not satisfied in proving convergence to theta zero, or we, we don't prove that, but we obtain things of this type, that in the limit n k d to infinity, with this ratio fixed, if you rescale in a certain way the error, this converges to it a certain function of epsilon, delta, and other parameters. Okay, so this is the kind of functions that Lenka has been uh, writing in, in everything. So you get the non-trivial limits, and this is noisy in the sense that you cannot, sorry, you cannot make the approximation that theta hat is very close to theta zero in the perturbative argument, but you really have to take into account the fact that theta hat is different from theta zero, and you get uh, a non-trivial limit. Okay? So from a point of view of physics, and I think also of probability theory, this is the most natural uh, regime. So in this talk, I will look at this general theme. But, uh, okay, this talk, but a very simple model. Okay, so the reason why I took this model is not because it's uh, interesting. Okay, it's also interesting per se, but... But the most important reason why I chose it is that it's, it's the simplest. I think it's pedagogically the, the best model to, to start explaining this. Okay, so this is the following model. Uh, you have an unknown parameter that is a vector in n dimension. You observe an n by n matrix. And this matrix is theta 0, theta 0 transpose plus noise. Uh, and the noise is... Uh, a GOE matrix. So this means, uh, in particular, that the entries above the diagonal are IID normal 
zero, one over n. And here I scaled things in such a way that the operator norm of these two terms is of the same order. Uh, and this is <coughs> the operator norm of this is two, and the operator norm of the low rank part is, is uh, lambda. Okay, so lambda is a, a, an SNR, and I'm interested in what? I'm interested in theta zero that belongs to this set theta. So to give you a statistical model, I give you a set theta of parameters to which it belongs. And here I take the set of all vector theta in Rn, such that what? That, ah, okay, so this is lambda because, sorry, because typically I take theta 0 to that is uh, of order n. Okay? Such that the empirical distribution of theta is equal to some given fixed empirical distribution which will take the form So very simple. I could be... Uh, okay, let me... Huh? This distribution p epsilon, so this distribution is, is a two point distribution that I normalize in such a way that it has zero mean and unit values. So what I want to do here, I want to come up with an estimator, so something that, given the metric, spits out a vector, and the way I will quantify the quality of this estimator is simply by computing the scalar product with theta zero, that is basically the same thing that Laurent was computing in the morning. So I'll do the following, I'll compute theta hat of x theta zero, <coughs> and normalize by the norms, just to Avoid trivialities. And I take expectation of a metric x. So this is expectation of Rx. And okay, what a statistician would do do, do the uh, mean, do the worst case overall theta zero in this quantity. Okay. okay, so this is the statement of the problem. Uh, Again, there is an unknown vector theta zero. This has an empirical distribution that is this one, that is that n times epsilon entries that are equal to a plus, and n times one minus epsilon that are equal to a minus. This a plus and a minus are two special coefficients. A function of epsilon just set them in such a way that the mean is zero and the variance one. One special case that I will look at in particular is the case epsilon equal 0.5. Uh, and it's the case in which half of the entries are plus one and half of minus one. This is sometimes called Z2 synchronization. And the other special case of interest is epsilon small. Okay, so epsilon equals zero point zero zero five. This is the case in which you know, most of the entries are very close to zero and the rest are big. Okay? And I'm interested in, in computing you know, a theta hat that has a large scalar product with theta zero. Okay, so ideally I would like to uh, uh, maximize this overall, so overall estimator. Okay? Now it turns out that this problem is extremely symmetric. So because of this symmetry, taking any theta zero is equally different to estimate in this class. You can imagine of permuting the entries, and this clearly make, doesn't make the problem harder or easier. So you could as well take the expectation of that theta zero. So this is essentially the same that taking the expectation of our theta zero with this distribution p epsilon, expectation of our x, theta hat x theta zero.
So this is the Bayesian problem in which uh, theta zero is itself random, and by symmetry, this is basically the same as the minimax problem in this case. Okay, I could be more general. Here I'm restricting myself to a general, a very special class of distribution because I want to be very concrete, uh, very simple. You could take here another uh, distribution and do say exactly the same story, and many of the results that I state hold you know, for general classes of distributions under some tail conditions. So this is what I call the overlap, or it's called sometimes the overlap for an estimator theta hat. And uh, to check that, uh, okay, perhaps I'll call it here the overlap. To check that we understood uh, the setting and the problem, a special estimator is the spectral estimator that came up already in the long talk. <laughs> Uh, you just say theta hat of x is just the first eigenvector of x. Okay. In this case, there is you know, a well-established theory that is random matrix theory. Uh, in particular, this theorem is results by Baik, Benarus, and Peche that tell us exactly what is the value of this in the large, in the large limit. So what they, they tell us, they tell us that Qn of, so let's call this the PCA estimator, principal component analysis tells us that this is square root of 1 minus 1 over lambda square positive part plus mole of 1. Mm? Okay, uh, so if you trace a curve of this, this looks like this as a function of lambda. Here there is 1 oh, as a function of lambda. This is Q1. Q infinity, it's 0 until 1 and then becomes 0 at infinity. And that is a phase transition at 1 that is called the PPAP. Phase transition is where the spike, I mean, the first eigenvector starts getting correlated. Okay, so the question that we want to ask, that we are interested in, is can we do better? I'm actually worried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Oh. Oh. Wow. okay. Okay. Can we do that? Then? Okay, and then go over three things. Okay, so this is looks a lot like Lenka's talk, <laughs> but a petite a new one, we say in Latin. And uh, so we I still look at first look at can you do better from a purely Bayesian point of view for uh, neglecting computation, and then can we do better in point time uh, computationally? And third thing, uh, I'll talk about uh, a method that I think is more robust. Okay, and uh, okay, so these two are uh, result in the last couple of years. Okay? And, and this is my more recent result, you know, and a couple of months ago, so I will try to spend more time on this. Okay, so Bayes, okay, so first part, Bayes estimation. Okay, so you have a theorem that has already been cited, but not stated by Lenka, so, okay, I'll cite here. So, a version of this was in a paper by uh, Barbier et al. Say, and the link is included in the list of authors, uh, and uh, another version by Lelarge and Mulan. Okay, and the, paper, the theorem says is following. Okay, under this model that I discussed before, okay, I define the neutral information. This is what at gamma, so this exactly the same definition as. as Laurent gave essentially, where, where y and x are the following two uh, random variable, draw x0 g p epsilon times normal 0 1, and let y equal square root of gamma x0 plus g, and then yeah, take the radon liquid in derivative, take the log, take the expectation, 
and this is the visual information, and it's written in slightly different, but it's the same thing as, as Laurent defined. And define the following. Okay, now I have to write a long formula. The base gamma lambda. So this will be arc max over a gamma no negative of some formula, which is lambda square over four plus gamma square over four lambda four lambda plus minus gamma over two plus i of gamma. Okay, so this is uh, also very similar to this integral formula that Lenk have wrote, except that I think it's nice to write it in terms of uh, mutual information. Uh, so then you maximize this funny function, this funny this function, I call it psi of gamma and lambda. Then, then uh, limit n to infinity of qn of uh, of what? Of lambda and theta base. Right. Whatever theta base is what is whatever maximizes the overlap. So the, the, the optimal estimator is the estimator that optimizes this, this criterion. Okay. And this is square root of gamma base of lambda divided by lambda. Okay, so this is this is the the story and uh, uh, <coughs> base estimation and the you know, why, why you can prove this basically uh, the first step is to write the posterior okay let me write it here perhaps the first step in the proof or in understanding the stuff about this problem is to write the posterior of theta given x. Okay, what is this? This is uh, proportional to what? My base formula is the prior p of theta, p epsilon of theta. This is this product prior that I wrote, times the probability of x given theta. So this is a Gaussian, so this is e to the minus n over 4, x minus lambda over n theta theta transpose. This factor is simply due to the fact that W is a GOE. Then you expand this. Okay, this is a factorized form, and when you expand it, there is a square of x that doesn't matter because it's just a normalization. And then you have a lambda over 2, and then you have theta x theta, and then you have minus lambda square over 4n, uh, and then you have uh, theta square square. So if you forget this, this looks really like a Gibbs measure for a spin model, so you can imagine that you can use spin glass with random couplings x. So you can imagine that you know, physicists have something to say about this. So what, what happens if you trace these curves? Again, as like I said, it's very easy to you know, uh, solve this optimization uh, numerically on your laptop. Now I solve them by just by pure thinking. <laughs> For two cases, epsilon equals 0 0.5 and epsilon equals 0 0.005. And you see the following type of curves. Okay, first let me try. So this is lambda and this is q. First, let me trace what is the, the plot for uh, BBAP. So this is lambda PC, let's call it. It's some curve like this, it's the same. <coughs> the spectral method doesn't care what is the distribution of the entries of the theta. It's, it's you know, universal with respect to that. And then, okay, I found one. Okay, I found one. And then, if you uh, if you plot the curve that is obtained by this Messier formula, is of course better, but it's, in this case it's always zero up to one, and then it becomes better. 
So it has a phase transition at the same point, but then is superior for any lambda bigger than one. Here, the phase transition is at diff a different point. At this phase transition, it has a jump, and then it goes to one. Right? So this is the information theoretic threshold, meaning is where you have enough information to you know, reconstruct your signal better than by random guesses, and in this case, it's you know there is a gap between these two thresholds, as in the block model for more than two components, and here there is no gap. That's for two components block model. Right. So this was the uh, first point of my bullet list. Second point of my bullet list. Any question about this? <laughs> Second uh, compute this thing efficiently. Okay. So it turns out that you know you can in some cases. As often in life the answer is it depends. And uh, one way to do it is by this AMP algorithm. So in this case we have one way to implement the algorithm is the following. I initialize a vector so I will have a sequence of iterates. I'll call them ZT in Rn and the initialization will be just by PCA, you start with a normalization constant times the first eigenvector of x, and then I iterate something like this. In this case, it's very easy. I will compute some nonlinear function zt, and then I subtract the memory term. And at the end of the day, I compute theta hat by just this function t. Oh, this is the first one. Okay, so what is the structure here? If you forget a, a little bit uh, for a moment this memory term, and if you forget this function, what I'm doing is just power iteration. So I'm basically computing the top eigenvector of f. So what I'm doing here is that I'm computing this linear nonlinear function, for instance, because I know that the theta hats are bounded. Okay? If you compute this principal eigenvector, it can be very large. You know, for instance, that your theta hat are plus minus one. So you might want to clip them. Okay? And then I keep iterating. Now there are two, uh, there is one important difference, there is this memory term that is important because otherwise the you know, symptotic properties as n goes to infinity are not the same. And the other important term is that here I don't put a you know, purely heuristic function, but there is an optimal function that has the following form. So this is y. This is a separable function. So we have a good use of notation. If I apply it to a vector y, I apply it separately to each component. And on each component, what I'm doing is uh, something like that. Computing for each component, what I'm doing is really I'm solving a scalar denoising problem. So suppose that somebody tells you for component i gives you a noisy observation of component i of your vector. Okay. So this will be so a single component from my x0. So this here the distribution is always x0 g is p epsilon and z. Right. So you know, for component i, you know that observe the true thing plus Gaussian noise with some SNR gamma t, and you compute the optimal estimator of x0, that is the posterior estimator, and this is what you do. Okay? Uh, so this gamma t, I will not tell you what to do, but this gamma t I will compute. Now, in 
this particular case, uh, one has to pay a little bit attention about what is the initialization in the following sense. The algorithm works if you start with a random initialization, but it's an interesting open problem to prove it. And so empirically, okay to use Z0 random, but in theory it doesn't work. Well, in theory, not that it doesn't work, but uh, you know, we don't know how to prove it. So we go around it by using this initialization, and since this initialization is non trivial, we have to prove a separate theorem about it. Oh, I don't want to erase this theorem. Okay. Okay, so we do the following. So what we do is the following. Take, uh, define the algorithmic gamma to be the inf of uh, gamma positive such that the derivative respect to gamma of this psi of so the first critical points starting from the last of this function and then what we prove is that if you like the limit of the number of iterations going to infinity and going to infinity qn at lambda for this estimator theta hat t this is equal to gamma alg lambda So what is the picture here is that we have this function psi that I brought up there. This is a function of gamma, and this in general starts somewhere, and then can have multiple critical points. In reality, in this special example, it's much simpler than that. But somehow, the algorithm gets stuck, stuck at the first critical point. So this is the algorithm performance, while if you were able to do complete Bayes estimation, then you will end up to the highest point. Okay. So this describes quite precisely what is the, the gap between, uh, between uh, uh, optimal estimation and uh, <coughs> okay, the conjecture is that no polynomial time algorithm beats uh, this value. Now the technique, I should mention, the technique, okay, this has been said by Valenka. Uh, so the basic technique for proving this theorem relies on, on okay, several ideas. One idea uh, is in a paper by both house and, uh, I don't know which year, but then we generalize with uh, most of variety. And then, uh, and, and this basically allows you to prove the following kind of limit theorem that for large n, for large n, if you look at this vector z at t, this is approximately square root of gamma t, where this is a deterministic number times the true vector theta zero plus g, where g is normal. Zero ID. Okay? So I wrote down that algorithm. This is the, the algorithm. This is an iterative algorithm. In general, this Z at T might have a very messy distribution, and it will have for any finite n. 
but in limit of infinite time, this is basically the two vector plus Gaussian norm. So it's extremely simple. So once you have this down, you have only to keep track of these colors. And this approximation is basically weak convergence for uh, finite dimensional modules. Okay. Excuse me, you said that the gamma t's were uh, pre-computed. Pre-computed. So pre-computed using this theory, you can pre-compute it. You can also estimate them from data, from the iteration of the algorithm itself. But okay, for proving a theorem, you can just derive them from the theory. Can you say something for a t which depends on n, or is it really? Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So here, attention, here I'm taking n very large and t large after that, so t is of order 1. I, how big I can take t? Uh, well, there is a theorem, there is a generalization of this by Ramji, Venkataraman, and Cinzia Rath that works for any t. If I remember correctly, it has to be log n over log log n. Okay? And uh, you don't expect to be able to go generically much beyond this t. The reason being that there can be unstable points <coughs> on which you know, the asymptotic theory tells you the state, the unstable point forever, but at any finite time you will diverge after log n number of iterations. But you know, perhaps if you have some additional contractivity property, then, then you can prove theorems for larger t. This, I think, is an interesting research program. Okay, now am I satisfied with this theorem? Any other question about this theorem? Am I satisfied with this theorem? Well, not really. What is an unstable point? Standard curve in your Ah, uh, uh, excellent, excellent point. So these curves, when you plot them here, let's use another color. Excellent point. I wanted to do it. <laughs> Okay, here you don't do anything because you cannot, and here you follow this curve. Fantastic. And you repeat the story here, but here you stay stuck at this point until the IT threshold, and then you jump off this curve. So this is very similar to the picture of Laurent, where uh, here you don't have intermediate half phase, either this is impossible or this can be done in polynomial time. Here there is a half phase, or similar also to what, what Lang had. Okay? Uh, the interesting point that we cannot currently prove in sparse model, for instance, with exceptions as in this, this sort of case, is that above this threshold, we can prove that we can follow the optimal curve. For instance, in the pure, in the, even in the two groups, uh, you know, sparse block model, we cannot prove that above threshold you follow the optimal curve. Right? So this is possible only for dense models. That the model. Okay, so this is very nice. And my conjecture is that, that I cannot improve over this algorithm, so why I'm not happy with it? Well, I'm not happy because the algorithm is really fine-tuned to the distribution of the model, to the fact that the noise is IAD in particular, and to the fact that you know, the true vector is drawn in an empirical distribution that I know. Okay? In particular, the first, the first is a problem. Okay? So one way to construct something that is, uh, and also that is iterative, this fact that I have to keep the number of iteration of order one and then going to infinity is not very nice, right? I would like to be able to have uh, something that converges at finite time. Right? In theory, you can say I will stop after log n to the one half iteration, but log n to the one half is trivial, so it doesn't make any sense. So something that everybody likes a lot are you know, what statisticians call M estimator. So what is an M estimator? It's basically an estimator that comes as solution of an optimization problem. Okay, so I would like to construct a cost function f of okay, m that is a cost function uh, in n dimension. So m is a n-dimensional vector such that I achieve the optimal performance, so such that today's estimator is 
this depends also on x, but I will draw it for thereafter, such that the theta bias is the solution of this optimization problem. Can I do this? Okay. I will focus here on x will equal one half. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we can, so this means the plus or minus one problem. We are, we are currently working on generalizing this. But for the moment, we have a theorem only for one half. And lambda big enough. All right? So I need a lambda zero. And lambda is to be bigger than lambda zero. And OK, if you are able to, to get to lambda equal one, uh, you are I'm very happy for you. OK, so what is the idea? One idea, one idea that is uh, very prevalent, very popular in machine learning is what's called vari variational inference. So what is this idea? Uh, it starts from following. Look, what you are trying to compute is the posterior. How do I write this as an optimization problem? I write this as minimization of the KL divergence between Q and the posterior. Uh, over all distribution Q that are this priority distribution on the hypercube. Here remember that, that your theta is the hypercube. So if you can solve this optimization problem, then you have the posterior. Of course, this is not a nice thing to say because uh, Q is uh, very high dimensional, it has dimensional to the end, but still. Okay, so this is the picture, this is the space of probability distribution plus one minus one to the end. Here there is your posterior. Uh, we want to reconstruct this. What is the idea of variational interest? I will not minimize over all this space, but I will minimize over a variety, a uh, submanifold in this space. And what submanifold do you want to take? Well, you know, we like probability, so the simple one is take product form distributions. Okay? So for a given vector m that is minus one, one, so in the solid cube, I'll define qm as the product where qmi or sigma is just the distribution of a plus minus one with expectation equal to a minus. Now, if you take this idea and you go ahead with it, you can you know, plug things in here and compute what is the, the, the KL divergence. KL divergence of QM and P theta given X is equal to certain function of M that is called the mean field free energy plus a constant independent of M and this mean field free energy is what? is minus lambda over 2 uh, M XM plus or minus uh, minus sum over i 1 to n uh, n of h of n by where h is the entropy, binary entropy function so it's the entropy of a single bit with expectation x of a rather market with expectation x So this is an idea really popular in machine learning. Uh, I will not give you citation numbers. It's used, for instance, in particular in what are called topic models, that are models for you know, finding topics in <coughs> corpora of documents. OK, so this doesn't work. So the question, I mean, I described your model. An approach, I tell you, that is extremely successful in practice. Does it work in theory? No. Okay, so as a part of our, our work, so this is going to work with some main uh, fun and myself. 
this doesn't work in the following sense. Suppose that I can optimize this cost function. Notice, by the way, that this cost function is something that makes perfect sense intuitively, right? What you are trying to do is somehow fit the data. This is basically the likelihood of the data. So this is the maximum likelihood objective, basically. But you say, okay, that is not quite the end of the story. If I love that small, I don't want to trust my data too much. So I'll try to maximize also the entropy. So shrink the m towards zero a little bit. So I don't want to trust too much this, but I want to shrink it a little bit towards zero. And for lambda large, the likelihood objective will prevail. And for lambda small, the entropy objective will prevail. Okay. So suppose that I can optimize this problem. Uh, then we prove that yeah, this is not enough. Okay, we proved it in very I compute the distance of the, this mean field estimate from what I should it should be computed, computing properly, that is an SCM. Huh? And there is the extra complication that theta in this model can only be term, determined up to a global sign, because I observe theta, theta, theta transpose. So I have to minimize over this sign. Okay? So modulo this minimization over this sign, this is the distance between the mean field estimate and the posterior expectation square, this is on the scale n, so I normalize by n, and I prove that this is bounded away from zero. Yeah. So naive mean field, so this is what is called naive mean field, in sometimes or mean field, doesn't work. And doesn't work because, uh, you know, in a sense we cannot neglect completely these dependencies. We cannot neglect. But your, your C depends on lambda, right? Yeah. And when lambda is large, C is the... Yeah, this C depends on lambda. Yeah, if lambda goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And in fact, there are results by... Harijou and uh, Thiel and one of his students, they look at mean field and prove, uh, you know, actually for stochastic block models or, or things like this, that if, if lambda goes to zero at some rate, then this becomes of lo lower order term with respect to the law. Okay, so that is interesting. So in a sense, okay. But I want to stick to this lambda further one that is this noisy high dimension. So if you are a physicist, you know the, what is the solution of this puzzle, and uh, you have been known it for 30 years. So this is what's called the top free energy. Okay. So this is the same as the mean field free energy, uh, plus an additional term, that is minus lambda square over 4. So I don't have time to go into deriving this correction term. But this is morally, it's shrinking a little bit more towards zero. Right? So basically, what is the effect that we were neglecting? OK, somehow it's, it's, it's shrinking a little bit more towards zero. The effect that we were neglecting is that when you compute xij sigma ti ti j, <coughs> And uh, Q. This is a bit larger than what you, you would hope. Okay? If you approximate the theta i and theta j as independent, this will be xij, mi, and j. Okay. But this, co this, this estimate is not good enough 
because the theta i and theta j tend to be under the posterior slightly correlated. So there is an extra term that is of order x i j squared times stuff of order 1. And when you sum over i j, since all of these are the same sign, they contribute with a term of the same order as this. So if you do this calculation carefully, you get this term. And there are many ways, actually, of deriving this. All right. So this is, again, this is this top stands for countless. that were not interested in statistics but in spin glasses uh, in, the, in the 70s both Taules and Anderson got Nobel Prize but neither of them for this thing. But, yeah, still, I think it's a very interesting ok, can we prove something about this thing? so this is in the same paper I should So the theorem says that this works. Okay? Namely, they find a set of critical points. So these are the set of vector m in the solid cube, such that the gradient of is equal to zero and, and f top uh, of m is to be smaller than minus lambda over 3. Okay, this is not specific. We look at all critical points. We would like to prove that the minima of this free energy are actually the base estimator. So we look at this and that you know, high dimensional function, function and dimension. You look at all critical points that are below a certain level. No, not just the minima, but everything, right? Uh, it's very easy that there are. Okay, first point, C star is non empty. We write probably empty. So there are, yeah, it's, it's not a, a silly statement. And second, uh, if you look at min n to infinity of uh, what? 1 over n square expectation for n to n square sup over all n in C star of uh, n uh, M transpose minus expectation of theta, theta transpose given x minus lambda square. So here I'm quantifying the error instead of taking this mean over the sign. There is always this sign problem, right? So instead of taking mean over sign, I'll try to estimate expectation of theta theta transpose. So I'll try to compute this. Since this is the T as a you know, side results of the theorem says that this is effectively of rank one, basically of rank one. You know, you can do the rank one of decomposition and get this. And we prove that this is zero. So basically all, all below a certain level, all critical points, there might we cannot exclude that there is more than one, but they are all very close to each other and they are all very close to the base estimator. Okay, so this also implies that if you look at, if you use this top estimator, uh, this gives you gamma base over lambda plus mod of four. Okay. Okay. Any question about the split method here? I just have a question about the mean fit. Uh, does it tell you that uh, you have a mismatch of the sign, or can you say something about this? What do you mean by mismatch of the sign? Uh, if you look at, uh, at the sign of M, uh, on the sign of the... Uh, okay, good point. No, we don't prove anything like this in this. We have another paper in which, okay, as a, as a small result in this paper, we have that for lambda between one half and, and one, you know, basically mean field gives you completely garbage, more or less. But this is the other... Yeah, it's the phase in which it's impossible, but still mean field gives you a result that is non-zero, while the real posterior is zero. So for lambda less than one, the real posterior is zero. 
but, uh, but uh, actually should be exactly zero. Uh, okay, modulo signs, but uh, let's forget about the signs. But the mean field in norm is big. Okay. So in this year, uh, we pro I think that one can use, uh, with a little bit more, one can prove also this matching sign, but no, we don't have such, we don't state such a result. Okay, so I don't know if I have ten more or five more minutes, because perhaps I'll try to do a five minutes sketch of the yeah. proof. Sure. Okay. But, maybe, but you erase your curve, because where, where does it... Ah, uh, okay, okay, I erase <laughs> it. It's the same question, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So this result is for lambda for only for the case epsilon one half. So, far. Okay. so in this case, what is the curve? One lambda So this is the curve, so there is you know whatever this is the spectral method, this is a t that is equal to base. So in the paper, uh, this paper will prove that there exists a lambda zero such that if you minimize the top free energy above this, you follow exactly this curve, right? Now, this is what we can prove. Uh, if you ask me what I think is the right, if you ask me to put my thesis in that for a moment, what I think is the correct thing, empirically seems to be the case that if you minimize the top free energy, you achieve this curve down to lambda equal one. But uh, you know, proving it, it's quite non-trivial because okay, um, okay, you'll see why if I sketch a proof, I can tell you then why it's non-trivial. What is epsilon very very small? Just believe. Ah, for epsilon very very small, I don't know. Okay. I, I always think that if lambda is big enough, this approach will work. I don't know if there is so. Good question. If you have epsilon zero five. Then I, I believe so. This is the base curve. Except I expect that for lambda big enough, everything will be fine. Here there is the algorithmic threshold. I don't believe this beats this algorithmic threshold. Now I don't know in between. I don't know if it reaches all the way. That's a good question. I'm very confused, but is that a practical thing to find the optimal of the top energy? AMP. <laughs> right. I mean, this, yes. I mean, uh, you can do AMP. Uh, in practice, so this is another important question. This, this cost function is non-convex, so can we minimize it? Uh, you know, when I said that empirically I reach it to, to this, this is by doing something very simple. I do gradient descent, starting with an initial, small random initialization near zero. We didn't do a lot of simulations, it's just a student did a couple of simulations and see it to work. It would be interesting to prove that this is the case. Right? And there are lots of other interesting computational questions in the The most interesting, I think, is can you construct a convex version of this? Okay? That would be very Because that's related to the hard phase, right? Because if you could yeah, find if you the could, minimum, you would go in the yeah, hard phase. Yeah, of so. course. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so you, you reach this, it's, uh, so, so you could go a priori in the hard phase if, if you could optimize this for any value of the parameter. We would expect it to be the case. Okay, uh, eraser. Okay, so perhaps I will sketch the offer proof. So I'll give you the idea of the proof at very high level. And you know, without loss of generality for the sake of analysis, we can assume that the true vector is the old plus one vector. Uh, and then I'll define a function t just computes a few statistics of this n-dimensional vector m, 
and the statistics that I want to compute are n times 1 divided by n. So this is basically the overlap with the ground truth. The second is the norm of m. The third is a funny object. And the third is a function that I will not even write uh, because it's a bit messy. But the important point about this function is that again a function of the empirical distribution of M and is such that this is equal to the top free energy on the point such that uh, uh, on the critical point. It's just, it doesn't depend on x, it's the function of the empirical distribution of m, but that the critical points coincide with that. Okay, and then, uh, and then we define for any, for any domain in R4, we look at the set of critical points in that domain, meaning the number of m in the solid cube, such that... Uh, I start dropping the subscript okay so this is the critical point and what we do is just compute and compute the expectation of this uh, and in particular we show that okay we already compute an upper bound in the expectation of the following form, this is the soup over all tau in the set U of some kind of large addition function, S of two. So you compute the expectation of these are two leading exponential order. So this is the key part, technically, the key part of the, of the proof during this computation. Now, the computation is tricky and there is you know, quite a few subtleties. Okay, uh, I will perhaps say something about it. Uh, so because of that, we, we simplify it and only prove an upper bound. You know, at least in some regime of the parameters, this should be equal uh, in some regime of Tor, because this formula is the same that physicists of things. So physicists com computed this thing by non rigorous method, and they got this kind of complexity function. So the first people who did it were for this problem. Uh, was probably very similar to this was where Bray and Moore, and so we get the same formula. Mm -hmm. So this makes us believe that probably this upper bound is tight, but can And then what happens with this function? How does it look like? <coughs> okay, now I erase this plot. For lambda small enough. So now I plot the function only as a function of m uh, to 1, of the first uh, parameter. Meaning that I optimize over all the others. <coughs> and uh, with always to 4 less than minus number. Uh, for lambda small, this looks like something like this. So as a maximum at 0. So to 1 is the overlap with the truth. So this is a number between minus 1 and 1. Zero. In general, most points are in the equator, and also most critical points are in the equator. This is what you would expect naively. Then there is an intermediate <coughs> regime of lambda. I'm being a little bit sketchy here, in which this function has a bump around zero. But then it can, goes below zero, but then comes back <coughs> and touches the axis. Touches the axis at some point to star. And this to star, you compute it, and it turns out to be the same as uh, the base overlap. Okay, basically expectation of at theta times 1 under the posterior. <coughs> theta times theta 0 under the posterior. Divided by n. Okay? So meaning that there are some critical points 
where the base posterior, there might be some critical points here, where the base posterior here, but there might be also a bunch of other critical points here that you cannot rule out on the basis of this calculation. And finally, there is a regime <coughs> of uh, lambda large. So this is lambda, this famous lambda zero, in which what happens, the curve looks like this. We touch the axis here, perhaps there is bump here, and we touch it. So this means that if there is any point that is below this <coughs> level minus lambda r3, it must have you know, a, an error close to the one, a scalar product with the, with the truth that is close to the base expectation. So separately, you prove, uh, we prove that there is at least one point below this level lambda over 3. So there must be also a critical point below this level, and it must be here. Okay. okay, so okay, perhaps I, I'll, I'll stop here and just say one, uh, one word uh, is okay, how, so as I said, the, the, most part, the, okay, the most interesting part of the proof is, is really computing this thing, and the rest is basically studying this formula and trying to get something out of it. Uh, so, how do you compute this expectation of the critical number? is uh, so you compute the expectation of critical number of uh, number of critical point by a Katz-Weiss formula that is okay points to something like this expectation determinant of the action of f conditional to the gradient of f at m <coughs> is this times the density this is the density of the gradient zero, and then there is an indicator of tau of n to mu, and then b. And this is something that people have done to compute this kind of critical points of random function, now starting with uh, Aufinger, Berardus, and Czerny. They started using uh, El Fyodorov even before that. to compute critical points of random, random smooth random function. Uh, the, if you ever see so any of this, uh, uh, you know that the hard part in this calculation is computing this expectation of absolute value of the determinant. This is a random matrix. And in this case, it's quite a bit more difficult than, OK, it's, it's more difficult than previous cases. doesn't reduce to previous cases, because the action of this energy is if you compute it, is basically this random matrix X plus a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix depend on M. Plus a low rank part. The low rank part doesn't really matter uh, for this calculation that we do. But this is still a GOE matrix plus a diagonal matrix. And uh, okay, the spectrum of this is not you uh, can compute it by free probability, but it's a you know, messy function of m, right? And then we have to plug it in here in theory. So conceptually what you do is, you know by free probability that the spectrum of this will be, you know, uh, the R transform of the spectrum will be the R transform of this plus the R transform of this. You have to plug this in here, compute the expectation of the determinant, that is in the expectation of log lambda mu. So you will get a spectrum mu n <coughs> that is given in terms of R transform, plug it in, in here, and then integrate over M. Okay. <laughs> so, so if you write the formulas there, they, you know, it's, it's, 
Then that's where we wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't read the physics papers that actually have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then that guides you a little bit. Okay, that's all I think. two parts, you know, two things, okay, this is also to answer your question. There are two reasons why lambda zero is not a one. One is that because there is this bump in this uh, expectation around zero, right? So this might be due for many reasons. The first reason is that there are really some critical points around zero. Second reason, there is no critical point, but we are computing just an expectation, okay? So we don't know that. That already sets you apart from one. Uh, the reason is that, okay, once you have the formula, now you have to study analytically the formula. I mean, study rigorously and prove that really the shape is. If I had just to compute it on my computer, I would get that the point would be exactly that one. Yeah. But okay, yeah. if I'm writing a proof. <laughs> no, I understand that proof would take differently, but if yeah. you were just to plot it, lambda zero would be some number. And yeah, it would be some number that now we, yeah, we didn't compute it, okay. but it's already a number bigger than one. Perhaps okay. it's four or five. I don't think that the ones that, you know, I think that the computing the expectation already gives you, makes you lose a factor. So I think that lambda zero that you obtain by the point at which this bump disappears is already not the tight lambda zero. Yeah, still interesting to know yeah. because 100 okay. or 1.5, right? Yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't know, yeah, two point. I don't think it's one after that. Okay. Yes, sir. I didn't. I missed the point at some point when you when you interpreted the, the last these three di diagrams. So what was important was the fact that the maximum of the complexity function is zero, or the fact that it's it is reached. No, the max okay. is different from zero. Okay. So the main fact that we use we use on this complexity function only one thing that if the complexity is negative, so this is a function in whatever four dimension. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it is negative in some region, you. So if uh, max uh, of s of tau, tau in u is less than zero, then we know that with that probability there is no critical points inside this picture. So this implies, so this is the complexity function. Now, I cannot plot in full sure. dimension, right? <laughs> but if I plotted in reversible, I would able to show you that for lambda large enough, there is only two points in which this complexity function touches zero. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Always for tau 4 less than. So there is four dimensional space, there is tau 4. We log, look below, so this is 0, this is minus lambda over 3. And we prove that below this level, there is only two points where this complexity function touches 0. Okay? And separately, we prove that there exists at least one point m such that f of m is less than minus <coughs> lambda over 3. So there must be at least one critical point. In fact, by symmetry, two critical points mm -hmm. below this level. So there must be all the critical points must be there. And this, once you have that, that proves that all the critical points are, are close to the posterior expectation. <coughs> Any other questions? I don't know if there are no others. Did, I misunderstood, but at some point when you were saying about this third point, you were explaining that it's more robust than <coughs> the AMP, but I didn't understand in which Did you think yeah, well, that this M estimator is more robust? Than yeah, the well, okay, you can prove some formal things about it. We didn't prove anything particularly strong. I mean, it's, it's, we didn't prove anything actually. But one thing that is clear is that if you change the matrix by something that has more operator now, then it doesn't change. You don't have this problem with the Which no, matrix, sorry, the X. noise? X. If you have a perturbation that has small operator norm, that doesn't change if the minimizer. But the key thing, I think, is even you know, less than that, is simply that, OK, give me any matrix. Maximum likelihood tells you maximize this. right? This is something that has meaning independent, maximize this over the hypercube. This is something that, even if the matrix is 
completely deterministic built by an adversary is something that has a meaning. Is the max if it is a graph, is the minimum bisection of the graph, and etc. So it has a meaning. Now what I'm telling you is add to this an entropy term and uh, this reaction term. Okay. This is basically bisecting that and then shrinking a bit towards zero. This is again something that is perfectly defined for any matrix and also has a meaning for you know, Okay, it's basically something like the mean cut shrunk towards zero. So it has existed that has a simple mean, relatively simple meaning for any matrix. If your model is correct, then it is Bayesian estimator. It has some robustness <coughs> property. We didn't investigate that too much. But obviously, for instance, if you do a small operator non perturbation of X, this doesn't change, and similar things. Not just small cut normal perturbation in the Okay. Uh, so, you know. I see. You. So, your point is that even though the proofs would be challenging, that this minimization could work. Yeah, no, this in general will not. Okay, so this will give you the, the optimal thing if you do a small cut non perturbation. In general, if X is known from your model, it's adversarial. Well, this is not necessarily anything, but it's still something that has. A meaning. If you have a, a given, for instance, community detection problem, and somebody tells you, okay, the graph is arbitrary, it's not coming from the stochastic block model, I'll tell this person, well, if you can compute the mean bisection, just bisect it into parts in such a way to cut the minimum number of edges. If you can, and this is, of course, NPR to do, but let's see, say that you can do it. This, this way of partitioning the graph has a lot of nice property. If I tell this person, this is a graph, a graph, a compute BP and solve BP, etc., this is something for a general graph doesn't have a specific meaning, right? So, that's what. And, and so, if, if you try to implement this minimum bisection problem on the stochastic block model, do you recover? Well, you know, if you do on the sparse model, this, uh -huh. this will not be the right. Okay, I think this generalizes if you take, you can generalize more or less problems more or less. You might hope to be able to generalize this theory to adjacency matrices that are uh, dense. Okay. Okay. So, dense means logarithmic degrees or something. Mm. So, mm. not the setup of Yeah, the so if you, if you go on bounded degree, then you can write free energy expression. There's something called the beta free energy. Uh, or the beta payers free energy. This this is a free energy that takes into account, you know, single point marginal and pay, pairwise correlation, and the fixed point, you know, the stationary point of this free energy are basically the fixed point of belief propagation. And uh, I would expect that minimizing this free energy would give you the the rise by base optimum. Okay. And now studying this, it's even more complicated than studying. <laughs> <coughs> so I think uh, I mean, one thing is about this one reason why this is I mean here at least the as far as I, our proof goes there is no simplification that comes because of this base property this the Shibani property that uh, like I was mentioning and in fact this formula we, we probably you know even for the shared compatible model and so A slightly technical question. I mean, you don't have problems with divergences of the diagonal parts here, when n, some of the coefficients go to one or minus one. Yeah. What? Not here. And when you when you compute. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Take care of. Yeah. It's not a nice, uh, such a nice question. <laughs> right. But okay. So. Okay, so the way we take care of it is that we basically prove that all the, the critical, we have a separate, you know, few pages in which we prove that all the critical points are inside the, inside the is in, uh, you know, in hypercube of sides of between 1 minus e to the minus something. <laughs> Log n squared, I don't remember at that time. Okay, between 1 minus epsilon a, minus 1 plus epsilon n, and 1 plus epsilon n. So all the critical points are in a slightly shrunk hypercube. Well, <laughs> right. 
just one question. So for the tap free energy, could you have the, some constraint on M in order to uh, in the case of uh, sparse SBM, was it just mm -hmm. with the expression before? So in the case of sparse SBM, uh, adding some constraint on on M could help. Or? Help in what sense? Uh, to, to, in order to, to improve. Uh, so what you say is that. Uh, yeah, in so sparse case, you, you cannot uh, reach. Uh, yeah, so in sparse case, this will not give you the base. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can always solve it. You know, mm -hmm. we're not the, I, will, I don't expect it to be to give you a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because even the maximum likelihood, mm -hmm. even in sparse case, so this is maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood in the SBM doesn't be bad. I mean, it doesn't get the right free state transition, mm -hmm. but does, you know, empirically it's very close to it. Now, okay, so if you now minimize this, Oh, it will not be bad, but will not get you really the base marginal. And the reason is not uh, global. I mean, the reason is that here I'm taking, if you if it was clear my explanation before, is that I'm taking into account correlation between vertices you know, a little bit better. But still, I'm taking into account the next order. Now, if you now look at the sparse SBM, correlation between two random vertices are small, but two vertices that are connected by an edge. They are of order one, those correlation, right? So you have to take into account. So the beta free energy does that by writing a free energy that is not function of one point marginals, but is function of all one point marginals and all joint marginals along an edge. Okay, so now you have a, a function that is a function of correlations on edges and magnetization on expectation on vertices. Right? And, right? It's not usually, I mean, I could write it if you were five to minutes, but, you know, but, you know, it's not, but, you know, now the analysis I would expect it is quite a bit more complicated. <coughs> okay. Okay. We've got no more questions. Let's thank you. Okay.